Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to spend some time here talking about the folate cycle, and I highly recommend that you go back and watch my video on the methionine cycle before watching this one uh, because it'll provide you a little bit of insight as to why this cycle is important. Uh, at the very least, watch, make sure and watch both of them. Uh, at the end of this video, I'm going to show you a picture of how these two cycles interact with one another. You really cannot fully understand one without understanding the other. Okay, so we're going to start out with dietary folate. And folate is a B vitamin that comes in our diet. We cannot make it ourselves. And uh, so this... This vitamin, this compound, is absorbed in the intestine, and it's absorbed more proximally than B12. Remember that B12 is absorbed at the very end of the small intestine, whereas folate is absorbed in the duodenum or in the jejunum. Now, I just want to preface this uh, with the fact that both folate deficiency and B12 deficiency can result in a megaloblastic anemia, and they're both associated with dietary deficiencies. Now, if you've got a patient with a weird diet, maybe they're eating bread and potatoes and stuff, and they develop a megaloblastic anemia within a few months, they've got a folate deficiency because B12 can be stored in the liver for a very long time, for years. Now, on the other hand, if you have a vegan and they have been on that diet for years and now they're developing a megaloblastic anemia, then it could be B12 deficiency. And I could see a question like that coming up on the test where they give you a length of time where they've been on a weird diet. And if it's only been months, then you gotta go for folate deficiency. Okay, so with that aside, Dietary folate gets converted to dihydrofolate, and you do not need to know the enzyme that does that, but it is reduced. Then dihydrofolate gets reduced further to tetrahydrofolate, and you do need to know this enzyme. This enzyme is called dihydrofolate reductase, and in order to reduce that dihydrofolate, it does use NADPH. Next, tetrahydrofolate gets converted into something called 5 10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. And we're going to come back to that because that plays another role too. Then 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate gets converted to 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate. And this is kind of our point where we start to interact with the methionine cycle. So the enzyme that does this is called methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, MTHFR. And when you've got 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, what you have is a tetrahydrofolate with a methyl on it. And that methyl can be donated to something else. And typically, it is donated to homocysteine. And by doing that, the homocysteine then becomes methionine. Homocysteine itself is not really useful, and as a matter of fact, it's dangerous. We want to get rid of it because homocysteine raises the risk of developing plaques in your arteries. So we want to get rid of it, either forward through cystothionine beta synthase and on to cystothionine and out the vomit pathway, or by salvaging it and putting it back into methionine, which is an amino acid that can be uh, put into protein synthesis. So the enzyme that does this is called methionine synthase. Isn't it nice when those enzymes do exactly what they say? So these are the two ways that you can get homocysteinuria. So you can get it here, or you can get it here. Now, the reason that this would cause homocysteinuria is, well, if methionine synthase isn't working, homocysteine builds up because you can't convert it to methionine. And if MTHFR is not working, you can't generate the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, and so there's nothing to convert the homocysteine to methionine. And so consequently, you're going to have a homocysteinuria with a low methionine. And again, I talked about that in the methionine cycle. Okay, so another thing that 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate can do is that it can donate a methyl group to something called DUMP, deoxyuridyl monophosphate, which is part of RNA synthesis. But we need something called DT. 
DTMP. And DTMP is uh, used for DNA synthesis. So the enzyme that's responsible for catalyzing this reaction is called thimidylate synthase. And thimidylate synthase, synthesizing thimidylate, or in this case, deoxythymidine monophosphate, uses B12 as a cofactor. So folks, this is why folate and B12 deficiency give you megaloblastic anemia. You need both. You need the folate to generate the 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate. You need the B12 for thymidylate synthase to work. If you don't have either of those, you cannot generate the thymine bases for DNA. And so various cell lines are going to stop developing. And the big one is hematopoietic precursors. So you're not going to be able to generate those red blood cells. The precursors to those red blood cells are large. They're going to get out into the circulation and you'll have a megaloblastic anemia as a consequence. Okay, so let's talk about some drugs because there aren't really any diseases with this going on. So there are two drugs that inhibit thymidylate synthase, and I'm sure you've heard of at least one of them. And the first one is 5-fluorouracil. 5-fluorouracil will go on to that thymidylate synthase and it will get converted to 5-fluoro-DUMP. And so then it will get incorporated into the growing RNA strand and then it will terminate the RNA strand and the cell will die. There's another drug called capacitabine. And capacitabine is just a precursor to 5 fluorouracil So these are both chemotherapy drugs. The next enzyme that we block is called is the dihydrofolate reductase. And so there are a few different drugs that do this. The first is called methotrexate. And methotrexate is used for chemotherapy, but it's also used for as, as an immune therapy uh, for autoimmune diseases. So that's methotrexate. The next is trimethoprim. Trimethoprim is primarily used as an antibiotic in conjunction with sulfamethoxazole. And so trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a very common drug given for bladder infections uh, along with other things. And sulfamethoxazole works completely differently, but these two drugs in tandem work really well for a, a variety of infections. And then the last one is called pyrimethamine. Now this one you probably don't write out for a whole lot, but pyrimethamine will come up on the boards because it's an important treatment for toxoplasmosis. So let's say you've got a patient with HIV AIDS, they come in with focal neurologic signs, you think, hmm, maybe they got cancer, what's going on? You get a CT, you find uh, ring enhancing lesions, you don't know if it's CNS lymphoma or if it's toxoplasmosis. So you give them pyrimethamine sulfadiazine and the idea is if they get better, then it was toxoplasmosis. If they don't, then you need to go in and get a biopsy because they may have CNS lymphoma. Okay, so those three drugs block dihydrofolate reductase, and you've got to know that for the step. Now, one more thing before we go is the drug phenytoin. Now, phenytoin doesn't block any of the enzymes here, but there is a way that this could come up on boards. I have seen it on a UWorld question where phenytoin is brought up as something that inhibits the absorption of folate. Okay. So phenytoin is an anticonvulsant. It's given for seizures, and it's also to some degree given for neuropathic pain as well. But the way this typically comes up is that you've got a young woman, 28 years old. She's trying to get pregnant. She's on phenytoin. Um, and uh, you may be asked what's one of the possible side effects that that could have, one of the challenges it could, be, it could present for her pregnancy. And the fact is, is that it's going to reduce the amount of folate that she has available. And so consequently, you can get neural tube defects. So women who are on phenytoin who want to get pregnant, ideally, we want to switch them to a different drug if possible. But if we can't, then we need to make sure that she's getting a large amount of folate in her diet as a supplement before she gets pregnant. 
So this is just the folate and methionine cycles put together. Uh, so if you watch the video on the methionine cycle, uh, this should make complete sense to you. I've listed all the places where you can get homocystinuria. We talked about two of the homocystinurias again here. And then we also talked about these five drugs that interfere with the folate cycle. And that's all I got for you. So this should be good enough for you to understand these two cycles.